before Alexander Volkanovsky, Max Holloway, Artem Lobov, and Jose Aldo, there was another king in the featherweight division, clocking fools and taking names. You might know him best as one of the head coaches at American Top Team, who has worked extensively alongside some of the biggest fighters in the world, like Joanny and Jacek, Amanda Nunes, Dustin Poirier, and Jorge Masvidal. But before all that, he was a fighter himself, and a damn good one. This is the story of a man whose resume has been lost in the shuffle, and who deserves to have their praises sung. This is Mike Brown. Brown entered the UFC in 2004. He fought up at lightweight against the inimitable Genki Sudo, who was just four months removed from heel-hooking Butterbean in K1. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's a weird one. Brown used a jab cross to close distance on the enigmatic Sudo and move into the clinch. From here, he dropped for a single leg and then bailed on the takedown to land this banger of an overhand before re-engaging in the grappling. Shortly after, he ended up on his back against Sudo. Unfortunately, he was undone in a sequence similar to his first loss in MMA. Fighting Hermes Franca back in 2001, Brown had been controlling the action from guard, landing good ground and pound before getting caught in a triangle. In this instance, he avoided the triangle, but Sudo was able to catch the armbar, despite taking some heavy shots. After the fight, Brown was let go from the UFC. It was exactly six months later that Brown fought future UFC veteran Joe Lozon and found himself once again tapping to a submission. In Brown's own words. This one crushed me. This was this was like, I mean, broke my heart more than any other fight. I was devastated, man. Like I was I was really close to retiring after that. But hey, he didn't retire. He was still nine and three, and only three years into his MMA career. Instead, he went streaking. Brown won eight of his next nine after his loss to Lozon, setting himself up to move into the WEC, which was, at the time, the top of the mountain for fighters under 155 pounds. After a gruelling decision win against the very much underrated Jeff Curran, Brown was thrown to the wolves and given a WEC featherweight championship fight versus Uriah Faber. Faber, on a 13 fight win streak, was a three to one underdog and looking down his resume, it made sense. He was the poster boy for the WEC, sporting wins over Bibiano Fernandez, Joe Pearson, Jeff Curran, a young Dominic Cruz, and most recently, Jens Pulver. He had won the WEC Featherweight Championship versus Cole Escovedo back in 2006, and had successfully defended it five times. Besides the decision victory over Pulver, all of those defenses had come via a finish. Faber was the featherweight division for the American audience. Brown came out and had some issues on the feet, struggling with the overhand and the straight right of Faber. But in the clinch, Brown showed his strength, even pushing Faber over when the champion went for a knee with a single collar tie. After a beautiful double leg on the fence, Faber popped back up and went with a reverse elbow off the cage. Brown effectively clotheslined him with a right hook, and the follow-up was significant enough to crown a new featherweight champion. At 33 years of age, Brown had accomplished the dream. A thunderous overhand right led into a brutal head and arm choke versus Leonard Garcia for Brown's first successful title defense, giving his title winning performance all the more credibility. But it was his decision victory over Uriah Faber in their 2009 rematch, which validated his position as the best featherweight in the world. Despite having difficulties with Faber on the feet in the first round, Brown started using his lead hand as an entry gauge in the second, before exploding him with massive combinations. All throughout the fight, his wrestling tenacity was showcased as he constantly threatened from the front headlock, shut down many of Faber's patented escapes from Turtle by hooking the leg, and stayed in Faber's face on the feet, even when he was struggling to land with his overhand right. It was as tough and as gritty a championship performance as you can get, and it cemented Brown's place atop the heap. Of course, that same night, Brown bested Faber again. A 14-1 Jose Aldo went and flying kneed Cub Swanson eight seconds into the first round to secure a title shot against the king of the division. Five months later, the two would face off for the belt, and the lightning-fast Aldo would capture his first major championship, TKOing Brown in the second round. The 23-year-old Aldo wasn't the technician that he is today, but his ridiculous speed made up for some of his technical issues. 
Brown, who typically leans heavy on the lead leg, moving him with his jab, was hit consistently with Aldo's rear hand uppercut. And on top of that, the low kicks and Aldo's A-grade takedown defense were too much for the champion to deal with. Some might use this fight with Aldo and Brown's subsequent struggles as justification for not including him in a list of the all-time greatest featherweights. After losing to Aldo, Mike Brown went 4-4 four four to conclude his career. But all the greats have declines after their prime, unless they're GSP and retire in the midst of their reign. When Mike Brown was at his peak, he was a force. Between August 26th, 2006 and June 7th, 2009, Brown won 10 consecutive fights, seven of them by finish. Of his four losses prior to the Aldo fight, Hermes Franca, Joe Lozon, and Genki Sudo all fought the majority of their careers at 155 pounds. Against more natural featherweights, Brown was a wrecking machine. And even though his striking was limited, he had massive power, good sensibilities on the bottom, brutal ground and pound from guard, and he knew how to land brilliant shots coming out of the clinch. So yes, whilst he rightfully earns the bulk of his credibility through his tremendous coaching resume, Mike Brown, the fighter, should not be forgotten.